Uh, now I'm going to talk on um, the uh, American experience in uh, Missouri, which is a small state in the Midwest, for those of you who don't know where we are. Uh, not so more, not so more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not mine. Gave it to you this morning, remember. Okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about is a program that we have in St. Louis, which is funded by the Bureau of Health Professionals. We've got just under a million dollars a year for three years, with a possible extension for five years, to see if throughout the state we can get 90% of people eventually screened for frailty, sarcopenia, and cognitive dysfunction. Are we winning? Um, so, and what we're using is a series of tools that have been validated in multiple con uh, continents. So let's see if we can go on. This is important, I think, because this is the availability of geriatricians in the G7 countries. And uh, some of this is a little bit of a guesswork because it's a little hard to define how many geriatricians are in any country. But you'll notice that the UK basically has the most USA has some, but I have to point out that in 2000 we had more geriatricians in the United States than we have now, so we're going downhill. Um, and uh, basically when you look at it compared to the percent frail in the populations, there are actually very few geriatricians available. So the concept of our grant was that there will never be enough geriatricians. I think there should be, but uh, I can't find people who want to come and train to be geriatricians because we're the lowest paid specialty in the United States and money makes a difference in the US. So fundamentally the question was then, if that's the case, can we get primary care physicians to do what geriatricians would normally do at least at a very basic level. So as you all know, geriatric assessment is a systematic interprofessional approach to older adults. You diagnose geriatric syndromes, you develop targeted uh, treatment plans and improve patient outcomes. It focuses on function and quality of life. The original big study was done by Larry Rubenstein when I was at UCLA uh, with Larry. And what Larry showed is that if you intervene, you assess, and you actually do stuff, you will improve outcomes. And there are a number of meta-analyses, and they all basically show that geriatric evaluation and management will improve function and decrease mortality, decrease nursing home replacement. So what we did is we developed a rapid geriatric assessment with an early detection for early detection of health problems uh, when interventions are most likely to be successful. So this is going pre-disability, uh, used for common geriatric uh, problems, ideally provides a brief reliable method of detecting the problems and we can track changes over time. So what we believe the modern giants of geriatrics are are frailty, sarcopenia, anorexia of aging. Remember, people over 60 who lose weight tend to die much more rapidly than other people. You can't lose weight over 60 unless you do it by exercise. Uh, any other way is unacceptable. So for those of you who are younger, get to an ideal weight before you get to 60. And then mild cognitive impairment. And this is what we developed. We developed this rapid screen which consists of the frail index, the SARC-F, uh, the SNAC, the Simplified Nutrition Assessment, questionnaire for nutrition and basically the rapid cognitive screen uh, for, uh, uh, for cognition and then in addition to that we, we ask people if they've got advanced directives because certainly if you're frail by that time or starting to have memory problems that's the time to develop your advanced directives. Uh, so as you all know frailty uh, is defined as uh, when under stressful conditions the person has diminished ability to carry out important practice uh, activities of daily living. It has to be distinguished from disability ideally because you want to intervene before the person becomes disabled. Uh, and for those of you, anybody in the audience under 30, you can put your hands up. Oh, gee, not as... Oh, we got one. Okay. So you're really lucky. You're the only person in this audience who isn't going downhill. 
All the rest of us are on our way out. Okay, 1% per year roughly, and eventually if you do nothing about it, you'll reach the frailty threshold. Exercise may put it off. If you're unfortunate and you get a disease, you run into trouble. So this is the frail scale. It's fatigue, uh, resistance. Can you climb a flight of stairs? Uh, aerobic, can you walk a block or about 200 meters? Illnesses, do you have more than five illnesses or are you taking more than five drugs? And loss of weight greater than 5%. It's now got about 14 validations in four of the, everywhere except Africa, it's been validated around the world. And it seems to work well if you're three or more, you're frail. And uh, this is the study from Jean Wu in Hong Kong, where she simply showed that the frail question works as well as any of the more specific ways of doing it. So you can collect data about walking speed and all the rest, or you can just ask people, and you get exactly as good an outcomes whichever way you do it. Um, this is the SARC-F, which again is looking at basically strength, uh, uh, your assistance in getting up, uh, basically f uh, the other functions, and it's important to recognize that, as I'll show you, people with sarcopenia are not always frail, frail people are not also are always sarcopenic, and this has been validated uh, within our inner city in St. Louis, uh, also validated in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study with Luigi Ferrucci, and Jean Wu again did a large study where she showed that compared to all the sarcopenic definitions, and you know there's six or seven of them out there now, it works, and that included the Asian definition, it is better at predicting poor outcomes down the line. So simple questions work better than complex things. So we hear a lot in this meeting about how you've got to measure muscle mass and all this stuff. Don't, okay, it takes time and no physician's going to do it. Uh, so you might as well recognize that you can ask simple questions, the stack again, very simple questions. And we've shown that it predicts basically uh, weight loss in the next six months with very good uh, sensitivity and specificity. And recently a study came out of Japan showing exactly the same sort of thing. Finally, we have to recognize that families and physicians are more or less useless at recognizing when people can't think anymore. Uh, in general internal medicine in the United States, 90% of people who are demented are not recognized by their physician. Family practitioners do better. They only miss about uh, uh, 25%. But nevertheless, both groups do a terrible job picking up people with memory until they're so bad that you're certainly not going to be able to do anything. So we developed originally something called the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam, called the slums. I always get bad uh, vibes because it's called the slums. This is because my president of my university liked to build big, beautiful buildings and hated to pay faculty. So I always used to tell him he'd be more famous for slums than he would be for his buildings. Uh, he's not the president anymore, but that's how it is. And I should point out, this has been translated now into 31 different languages. So it's available throughout the world, uh, Bhutanese, uh, Nepalese, uh, virtually any language you want to find, we've got a copy of it available as for the rest of the RGA. And it works better than the MMSE picking up mild cognitive impairment. A number of studies have now shown this is the case. And uh, it works as well as the MOCA. So it's no better than the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, but it takes six and a half minutes. The MOCA takes about 10 minutes. Uh, the problem with this is physicians don't have time to take six and a half minutes. For average family practitioner, that's the full visit. So they would have nothing else to do and no time to talk to the person. So we looked at could we decrease this, and we found out that if we use five words, the clock drawing, then ask the five words, and then this nonsense paragraph, and in it you put a city, and the question at the end is which state, which province, or which country does the person live in, and those tend to be just as good and basically for dementia as the slums, for mild cognitive impairment, much better. And it's for MCI, the mini cog doesn't pick up MCI. This takes roughly two and a half minutes to do once you get used to doing it. So fundamentally, you can do the whole of our screens in about three and a half minutes. And we train people 
actually to do the screening uh, as in the doctor's office. So we're using secretaries, anybody can be trained to do it. So the physician doesn't have to do it. Uh, and I just put this up to point out that there are tons of things you can do about early cognitive dysfunction. We have tremendous fights with neurologists who say, don't screen, don't look, because there's nothing you can do. I'll just point out to you that you can get rid of drugs, treat depression, hypothyroidism, sleep apnea, atrial fibrillation, hearing and visual problems, B12 deficiency, and there are a ton of lifestyle things that really slow this down. The finger study showed this nicely. And I think it's totally dishonest of physicians now to say, I don't want you to screen because I am too busy. And that's what the neurologists tell me all the time. They're too busy, they can't take all these people who screen in. And the drugs don't work, I agree with you. We don't need the drugs, but these other things make a huge difference to my patients. So Gene Wu in Hong Kong actually did this combination and then did a full geriatric assessment on about half of the people and showed that the short questionnaires produce exactly the same outcomes as if you go and do the full geriatric assessment. What I'm trying to tell you is geriatricians are unnecessary, okay? It's another way of looking at it, and I don't believe that. I'm a geriatrician, I love being a geriatrician. But if we don't have us, we've got to find a quicker way to do it. And when Jean looked at it, there was overlap between the different things, but it was not complete in any way. So we looked at a diabetic outpatient, so we said, what about should we have subspecialists do the screening? So we looked at our diabetic outpatient, and what you see there is at age 50 to 60, about 16% of uh, diabetic outpatients were frail, 22% had sarcopenia, and 21% had mild cognitive function. The reason I like to show this is diabetics who can't think can't look after their diabetes. They prick their finger, they do these things, it's not going to work, and so fundamentally they have to be able to think. My endocrine faculty tell me all the time that their patients are terrible because they won't do the things they tell them. We did this to prove to them, and it turns out that all the people with lousy hemoglobin A1Cs are the ones who can't think, who the endocrine faculty don't realize it's no use telling somebody and sending them home. They're not going to remember. Okay, you've got to put in systems that will make a difference. So this is the outcomes. Sarcopenia turns out over a six-month period using the SARCF to be overwhelmingly the only thing that decides whether or not a diabetic will finish up in hospital or will actually have new disability uh, and also mortality. The mortality was virtually all associated with SARC-F and this was totally independent of hemoglobin A1C. So why should you screen? I think this is a pretty good reason why we should be screening. Um, We've also been looking basically in the community and here you can see that when we look in the community and this is the total data put together, frailty is very common, sarcopenia is very common and basically uh, anorexia is common and not thinking well is common in people over the age of 65. Um, this is just breaking it down to some extent with age, and you can see by the time you get to 85, really and honestly, these are huge problems in the community. So these are an iceberg because, you know, most physicians don't have a diagnosis of dementia. So just looking at it from that point of view, and then we basically divide it up into case finding. We have physicians doing this, and they actually do fairly well, and when we have basically case finding where we send medical students and social work students out into the community to case find. Um, when you put this together, the important thing that you notice here is that while there's overlap, there's a lot of non-overlap. So you have to do all of these separately and cognition tends to be very separated from the physical thing on a whole. We have available information seats that can be given to the older person who screened positive for these things. This is an example of the frailty one. Uh, here's the brain health one. Uh, here's the sarcopenic one. And these are all available on our website, agingatslu.edu. And the other thing that we've done is we've developed a com computer assisted management program. So now, if you do this in the doctor's office, the doctor says, say it comes up as fatigue, it says, check that they don't have sleep apnea, 
check for depression, make sure they don't have B12 deficiency and hypothyroidism. So while the electronic health records don't lend themselves easily, we're starting to get this into the electronic health records. So in Perry County, which is in the middle of nowhere in Missouri, it turns out that the physicians are using this and they're doing very well. And they've developed cognitive stimulation therapy programs at the hospital, physical therapy and coaching programs, a little bit like we heard earlier, uh, really working extraordinarily well. So we can make a major difference by doing this. And I think that's really what we would like you to remember. This is the website again, agingatslu.edu. Uh, so we are very excited about this approach. And uh, again, we're not going to have questions, so we're going to go straight on to Dr. Rai, and he's going to talk about uh, the Kihon Index in Japan.